Hello everyone, I'm Emily Womenemo, editor of Automotive IQ, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, The Future of V2X and Road Safety with 5G and MQTT brought to you in association with Hive MQ. It is a pleasure to introduce you to our panelists today. We have with us Dominic Obermeer, uh, CTO and co-founder of Hive MQ, and Dr. Gudo Gallen, heading IoT Automotive and 5G Strategy and Innovation at Vodafone. Welcome to you both. In today's panel, the experts will explore how innovations in 5G technology will improve road safety, the proposed architecture for V2X solu solutions, and how M MQTT can be used to enable V2X applications. However, before I hand you over to our experts to kick off today's panel, I'd like to quickly remind you this is an interactive webinar. You can send your questions to our presenters at any time via the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please include your name along with your questions and we'll aim to answer these during the Q&A following the presentation. You will also be able to resize all the widgets on your page to, in to ensure they fit to your liking. So with that short housekeeping note out the way, I'd like to hand you over to Gudo to begin today's presentation. Please kick, kick it off, please, Gudo. Thanks, Emily. Um, so let's start. I think the topic for today is pretty much around road safety. Um, safety is still a, a huge issue, and I would like to present uh, how um, HiveMQ and Vodafone are going to approach uh, uh, this topic. Um, safety, especially uh, in urban environments, is still, is still an issue. I think we have still more than 3,500 uh, fatalities on the road every day, and most of them are young people, uh, that's, that's, that's a problem, uh, and uh, vulnerable road users. So while cars are getting more safer, I think we have still an issue with pedestrians and bicycle drivers, especially nowadays where, where the e-bikes e are coming up, driving much faster. Um, I think there is something we need to do in order to reduce the, the number of fatalities. Um, Vodafone is committed to basically use the capabilities we have, not just the network, I'll come later to this one, um, to make our contribution. Um, I think we want to provide a secure and reliable communication channel, which is, which is key. So it's a more data-driven solution that we want to offer in the V2X space, uh, leverage our 5G and uh, edge cloud computing capabilities. So Vodafone is committed and have started to build a platform exactly addressing this topic. It's basically a broker in order to distribute messages in real time. And you will learn later on, also from Dominic, how the platform and the amazing technology like MQTT will help us to distribute more efficiently information in real time. So uh, initially, we want to, to be the trusted provider in Europe. I think not just in the markets we operate, it should be across all the markets in Europe. Uh, like we have our IoT service that we offer globally today. Uh, and we want to be a trusted European player for also road operators to digitalize uh, the, um, the, the roads and the, to, to monetize and to distribute the data in a very efficient manner. So um, our approach is obviously, I think uh, 5G is the key topic for us. It's not just uh, the radio technology that has some advantages against 4G. 4G is still our main capability, and I think the platform we are building also works on 4G, but I think 5G brings it to the next level. So you would get uh, a prime performance latency throughput with 5G. As well, and this is a concept of 5G, we introduced the notion of edge compute. So you, you, you see it also in the market as MEC, multi-access edge computing or mobile access, uh, 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 mobile edge computing. So what this basically means in our terms is that we have cloud capabilities, cloud compute capabilities in our core network. So it's not directly at the base station. I think right now this doesn't make sense. It scales best uh, from our perspective if you put hosting capabilities distributed all over Europe in, in the network uh, which means that data doesn't need to go through um, the 
through the internet to a specific hosting center and then back uh, to other devices. Also, what is important in this connected mobility uh, domain is you need to build an open ecosystem. I think uh, V2X is already there, but it's somehow isolated. So you have some silos. So some car OEMs already have private services. Um, <clears throat> you have some national activities using, using dedicated short range technology. Um, but this doesn't really fly in scales. Uh, so we need an open ecosystem. So based on the, the networks that we have, so the cellular networks that are ubiquitous anyway, um, and then you need open standards so that everyone can contribute and share data. So that's the key of our platform. And at the end, I think that's that's our vision that we have this edge V2X platform that works across all the operators. We are not just restricted to Vodafone um, and, and takes information from anyone in a anonymized manner. I think that's that's the key principle behind V2X, that all the data is anonymized, so you can't track anyone, but still you get the data and, and you, 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 can, you can use the data to increase uh, the safety. Just a few words on edge compute, because this is key and this is a bit new. I think I will not talk about 5G and all the advantages of the radio interface, uh, but for us, the edge compute environment is really key. Um, we use it in basically two different ways. So if you connect it to the public 5G network, you will have a distributed edge environment. So distributed all over Europe, you will see geographically multiple edge locations integrated in the core network. And then you can use it for AR, VR applications, or also for gaming and certain real-time IoT applications, and obviously for V2X. Um, I think it's we will monetize this with gaming. Yeah, cloud gaming is a good example. Uh, but I think um, if we can save lives with this one, I think it would be it 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 it, it would be. Um, I, I think we need to use the technology also for a, a different purpose than just making money and saving lives. I think is is a real uh, really good goal and uh, one of our uh, one of the purpose that we have. On the other side, you can use the edge in in combination with a mobile private network. So let's say in a factory, and then we call it a dedicated edge. These scenarios, you can you can run your robotics and uh, digital factory industry 4.0 applications at the edge with very very low latency, uh, because you just need to communicate a few meters to the next um, the base station of your private network. Um, and then the, the, the dedicated edge environment is basically in the factory. So that's what we call a dedicated edge. But v, for V2X, obviously, the distributed edge environment, I think, is, is key. And that, that's something I would uh, explain a bit more. So what is really the added value of this distributed edge environment? Um, first of all, it's the low latency. I think the edge environment, in our case, is designed that from any base station to the edge compute and back, we, we get to 10 milliseconds latency. And then you need to add a bit uh, on the radio so that, that you are for sure below uh, 20 milliseconds latency. Um, but it's also more bandwidth efficient because you do not need to send all the data to a central edge location somewhere in Europe and then back. You can keep the data local, and especially for V2X for traffic applications, there's no need to ship data around. I think uh, it stays there and will be computed where it is relevant. And this and V2X data has only local relevance, first of all. And because of that, I think the user experience is more advanced, right? I think our customers, our B2B customers, will will get a better performance, and this is great. It also keeps the data more private. Yeah, there are some regulations in some of the markets, uh, and this technology helps us to keep the data uh, local as well. Just on the end-to-end uh, -end latency impact, so if, if I just compare this to a traditional 
application without a Mac. So what you have on the interface, you have latency on the interface, so you connect your device, a smartphone or a car that you use as a road user through a base station to our core network. Yeah, and on 4G, you have typically, typically 10 milliseconds latency, and then you need to add up some latencies on the transmission before you then enter either the cloud inside of the, uh, the country or on the, a different continent or in the, in the same continent or on a different continent. So easily you get to around what I say, 100 millisecond of end to end communication latency. And then you need to add all the computing as well. So if we could reuse this, I think there are some advantages if you move from 4G to 5G, you, know, you can you reduce the, the pure radio related latencies to just a few milliseconds. But I think the majority and the, the, the majority of the impact uh, we are getting if we basically remove the transmission and the internet. Uh, that's only possible if you move then the hosting capability into our network directly. So the device just goes from the base station through the call, the carrier gateway in our core network straight into the hosting capability and then back. Obviously, I think um, this only works within a single operator domain, but we are already in touch with other operators. So to do basically cross MNO routing into uh, uh, another edge. So if there is a, another mobile network operator with the edge, I think we want to optimize the route from our network into their edge and vice versa. So that this becomes basically um, um, a standard for all operators. For our platform in the meanwhile, we allow basically also traffic from other operators. So we have two entry points. So one is from a Vodafone network with very low latency. And then from other operators right now, uh, we use the traditional path into the service because we do not want to exclude anyone from getting a V2X information. So now let's just explain, I think these are the capabilities that uh, we are using. So how does this work? I think we have our edge service platform, which is distributed. I think this, this red box is basically a distributed service. So you have multiple times the platform uh, being deployed in Europe on our edge. <clears throat> we have road users connected to the edge. So it could be a direct V2X capable car with an integrated embedded SIM card. Um, getting to the edge, it could be roadside infrastructure, but it could be also apps where we are. So we have SDKs for Android and iOS that we can provide so that uh, these devices will connect basically to the edge environment. And there we have the, we call it a V2X message broker. And um, I think Dominic will talk about this later on a bit more in detail, where we use MQTT as the fundamental mechanism to distribute information in real time. So if a car sends information to the broker, it will be immediately sent also to other devices in that specific location. That's important. So what we have implemented is a real time geographical aware message distribution capability. By the way, uh, you can not just use it for V2X, you can embed any kind of information, but it's in particular well suited for uh, V2X communication. And then on top, you can think about services for vulnerable road users to make them more aware, an intersection assistant uh, to manage high complex traffic scenarios, um, and, and also dig digital road uh, services to distribute information from road operators, for example, or from a, from a, from a city authority and distribute this information also in, in the geographies and to all the road users. So not all the road users might be connected, right? There are still people without this particular app or even without a smartphone. And in order to capture them, we are running pilots and trials to use um, AR capabilities, so object detection, path prediction from cameras 
in the cars, but also uh, cameras in the, the road infrastructure. So they could detect also anonymously objects. Uh, they just say, okay, this is a pedestrian, this is a bike, and this is the location, and it's most probably walking or moving into this direction. If you have this information, you can put it into standardized, anonymized V2X messages, feed the broker, and the broker will distribute it in real time. So that's basically the, the high-level concept. Uh, we have two main interfaces. One is about the road users and the, the, the distribution and sharing of information in real time. And then we have northbound interfaces to road operators, municipalities, where they also can derive some analytics or some statistics out of the data that uh, will be flying around the, the platform. Yeah, and I'm now happy to uh, hand over to Dominic, the, the CTO, to tell you exactly how HiveMQ is contributing and how their amazing technology make this all happen. Okay, thank you, Guido. So, um, yes, as Guido already mentioned, um, it's super critical to increase the safety on the roads. And besides on, let's say, the infrastructure layer, what we've seen, how MECs really are game changers for this low latency communication, we still need communication technologies on top on the application layer that allows us to distribute the messages where they need to be in basically um, real time. Um, so we can make sure that we have very low latencies and all messages get delivered in time. Because if you think about it, let's say if um, an accident is happening somewhere and you would get the message like a minute later, um, this is a problem because if you because you need that information possibly like in in 50 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, and not in, in seconds or even minutes, which traditional technologies usually are built for. Because what you clearly need here is we need technologies built for the Internet of Things. This means because we are connecting actually things here together um, and not humans, while most web technologies today are built, yeah, for the web, for the Internet of Humans. And so let me introduce you to you MQDT because I believe some people have never heard of it, so we'll give you a very high-level overview why this is important and why for scenarios like, like V2X, MQDT is really the best choice for this minimum latency um, um, communication and still adds so much on top that makes it incredibly easy for application users and application developers on top to work with that, and um, which also allowed to build this kind of, of projects um, like in a very short amount of time based on, let's say, this technology. So before we talk about why MQTT is important for V2X, let me quickly introduce to you MQTT as a technology. So what is MQTT? If you Google it and say, yeah, let's see what MQTT is, you will find multiple things here. You will find it's an IoT messaging protocol. So it's really an application level protocol that allows to send and receive messages in basically the lowest amount of time possible. It's based on a published subscribe principle, um, which I will talk about in a second. And it's really built for minimal overhead. This means it doesn't really add a lot of data, tra data traffic um, on top of basically the, um, let's say, the layers uh, below, which is uh, TCP IP in most cases. It's designed for unreliable for reliable communications over unreliable channels. And what do I mean with that? MQTT is a technology. It's designed for mobile networks. It's designed for satellite communication, mobile networks, and anything that is not connected with a wire. And as most people know, I mean, everybody has an extremely good job that we are connected all the time. But sometimes, yeah, even mobile networks are unreliable um, if you're basically going with an ECE somewhere, it, there could be, let's say, um, some areas um, in Germany or on other parts of the world where you don't even have coverage. So, um, and this is something the application messaging, messaging really needs to take care about. So it's super critical that application developers, let's say on the car, on the um, Android application, on the um, Apple application, 
on the iPhone application that they don't need to take care about it, that the underlying messaging protocol takes care about all these, these unreliabilities and make sure data flow um, really resumes what it needs to and so on. And MQT is built for bi-directional messaging. And as we have seen uh, in the slides before, it's so important to have data on the one side flowing towards, let's say, an, um, the cloud basically, or the, the MECs. But also we need to make sure data is flowing to the car, to the other um, participants, to the other things that are connected, like traffic lights and so on. So um, we get this bi-directional communication channel. And we need this, that bi-directional communication to happen basically in, in, let's say, a snap. MQT also allows to have different so-called quality of service levels. So even on the application layer, the communication protocol makes sure that um, let's say we can separate between unimportant data, uh, which is usually high frequent, um, and very critical data. So, P so the application developer in the car, for example, can decide this is a this is a message that needs to be resent, even if there are problems. Do we need exactly once guarantees? So a message arrives at the destination exactly once, or is it basically an ephemeral message, which basically if it gets lost, it gets lost for some reason. Nobody cares. So this is something the application protocol MQT also allows for. And now let me quickly uh, talk about the, the principles for MQTT. So MQTT is built on a so-called published subscribe architecture. A published subscribe architecture allows basically for complete decoupling of all participants. So in this case, we have, of course, the applications itself, um, which Guido presented, but also the things like um, the cars, the traffic lights, and so on. Um, and the cool thing is they don't know each other. They just know the middleware layer, the broker, and they connect to the broker and they basically tell the broker what kind of data are they interested in receiving, and they can just push data to the broker. And they don't care who's going to receive that, because a car shouldn't be aware of the applications consuming the, the data. Um, because this can change over time, and certainly this will change over time when more application gets, applications get developed that consume the data. So with, an, with MQTT, you have the MQTT broker in the middle, which is basically a data distributor. And in this case, a car would be connected all the time in an always-on fashion to the broker, would publish data um, on so-called topics, which is the data segmentation uh, the broker allows for. And then it would basically would publish, hey, I'm driving 60 um, miles per hour. Um, and then it would basically slow down, hey, I'm driving 50 miles per hour. Or, oh, I, there's an event happening. I detect something on the road. These are the events a client can publish. And then other clients can subscribe, in this case, to the topic speed. And so, in this case, a mobile app and some backend application would receive the data. And the cool thing here is you can have zero, one, or an infinite amount of receivers of data. So one data packet can be distributed to as many um, participants as required. MQTT is super, let's say, um, popular and widely used in connected car infrastructures today. So if you're driving a car from Germany, um, a, car, a US car, or, or uh, let's say Asian cars, chances are that MQTT is already used and um, for, let's say, proprietary services. And now this will also go to, to V2X here. Why is MQTT so popular here? Because of the so-called always-on nature. Because what's happening is the cars in this example here are connected to the broker infrastructure all the time. And this allows, similar to, uh, to the mobile phones people have, where you can receive so-called these push notifications. Um, this how this technically happens is also with your mobile device. Um, this device I have in your, my hand, which is an, an iPhone, is connected all the time to a server in the internet. And as soon as a notification happens, because I get a, in this case, what's an iMessage, a WhatsApp, or let's say a notification from, from Microsoft Teams or whatever, this will get pushed here direct, directly. So I get this like in, in a snap. Why? Because this device is always on. And with MQTT, the cars and the whole infrastructure using MQTT 
is always on, which is much more efficient than, let's say, the previous patterns that were used in the automotive industry a lot, which is using wake, so-called wake-ups with uh, usually SMS and then using some kind of um, web services with HTTP, um, which consumes a lot of power. And with MQTT, things get more efficient because you can design everything around this always-on connectivity. Also, MQTT allows for low latencies. And this is, for V2X use cases, incredibly important, as we've seen, because when it comes to safety, every millisecond matters. And this is why we're also uh, yeah, super excited and thrilled to, to work with Vodafone on exactly these use cases, because this actually saves lives. And how, but how do we get this kind of low latency? Because here in this example, we have a traffic light, we have um, a car, and we have um, on an MEC the, um, running the broker. And basically, as soon as basically the car publishes a message to the broker with um, the technology schedule presented, we have data coming to all recipients like the traffic light here in 10 to 30 milliseconds or even less. Why we have seen because of the always on nature of all the devices, but also because the underlying infrastructure layer is just so fast. It allows, we don't need this kind of cloud round trip because we really have the data local where we want it and we can push it around as needed. Which brings me to my next point is the push push communication. So the always on nature, I said, allows for push push data transmission. And for people who have a background in enterprise messaging, this might come to a surprise because usually most, let's say, message queues people know, for example, if there are a lot of products out there uh, of message queues. Um, usually these are not designed for a push push note for push push communication because usually the data is there basically addressed and as soon as somebody wants to receive the data you get it um i mean the details when it comes to the details this is a bit different but for mqdt it's always push push and even if a device is offline as soon as the device gets online again the data it didn't receive because it wasn't it wasn't online gets pushed instantly and this is really great. And this is how even at scale, and we have um, also for other use cases, we have customers who send in one message and distribute it to more than 1 million devices at the, at the same time. Um, you get this for each device, you get this snappy, basically real-time experience. And another thing I want to stress here is the bi-directional da um, bi data flow. And this is something um, a lot of people on the first glance underestimate how critical that is. Because if you think about it, if you have a car establishing a connection to the broker, on the one side, of course, you want to send data, hey, I'm driving, the, this is basically where I'm driving, this is my GPS data, and so on. So it will basically publish data all the time to the broker, which distributes that. But let's assume there is an event happening that you need to know about instantly, like um, there is um, um, a, a problem on the road before, which was detected by another car, or there is a, let's say, situation coming up uh, because of some, some cyclists um, and so on. You really want to push the data instantly to the car that is affected by that. And with MQDT, you have this open, always on communication channel, technically speaking, uh, with a TCP connection. It allows you, the cars, to send but also receive data. And this is full duplex communication. This means if you're sending data, you don't need to wait um, um, yeah, until you can basically receive the message. You will receive it automatically um, so you can react in the yeah, shortest amount of time possible, which is, in the case we have seen here, um, 10 to 30 milliseconds or even less. So there's one thing, and uh, of course this webinar, it doesn't have enough time to talk about this in detail, but it's important to understand that MQDT was built with security in mind. So it uses the same technologies that are used by billions of users every day for the web. So TLS communication is used here, similar to if you're uh, going to, to a browser on a, on a website, to your banking website, for example, the same technologies are used here. 
And TLS is also used for uh, communication between cars and infrastructure. So while, of course, uh, um, let's say there are multiple layers of security already and built in on the application side, this also allows for an additional layer of security. So you can make sure even, let's say, if you have a car that is hacked or some, let's say, things are, um, uh, yeah, you, you ca can make sure with TLS on the one side you have this encrypted communication channel, but also in case you're using certificates here, um, you can also make sure to, to basically um, disallow these kind of certificates to come there. And there are multiple ways here. So security is really on top of the mind here. This would be, let's say, a complete talk on its own. And um, if people are interested how to do security with MQDT, there is a lot of material also online. Uh, also, the MQDT security fundamentals uh, is something worthwhile reading, which walks through, let's say, all the different ways in order to secure MQDT uh, that, are, that are possible. But what we have here um, built with Vodafone is secure by design because this is just critical, um, because this is critical infrastructure that needs to be secured. So how, how does it actually look like? So when, how, how is this deployed? There's one thing um, we really haven't talked about yet, which is basically high availability and the operability. This is something why HiveMQ as an implementation of the MQTT standard is so important and so critical. And I haven't said that before, just to be clear, MQTT is a 100% open standard. It's standardized by OASIS which means um, it's not that there is one vendor for MQTT. It's an open standard similar to HTTP, um, which means if, let's say, for V2X infrastructures, MQTT is used, which is used today, the, the vendor also asks us, HiveMQ as a broker vendor, actually this doesn't matter because um, other vendors can also be used here because the open web, the open standards are so critical. The success of all the technologies we have today is based on the openness. And this is also true here for MQDT. So it's completely open. Um, there's still an, a caveat. Uh, there are a lot of MQDT offerings out there. If in case for, you want to look at it for, for other use cases, um, make sure that the thing you're looking at supports 100% MQDT because for use cases like V2X and with uh, car communication, it's so critical to have a 100% compliant implementation. HiveMQ is one of them. Uh, and basically, the HiveMQ Enterprise Platform connects devices with MQDT. We support up to 10 million devices per deployment um, connected at the same time. And um, HiveMQ basically also connects to the enterprise. It runs everywhere. It runs on cloud providers, Kubernetes, and so on. And of course, also on the MEC infrastructure. So what we've built here together with Vodafone is we um, HiveMQ is now running, as Guido pointed out in, in his slides, on basically the MECs, which allows for this kind of real-time communication uh, and this edge communication. Uh, but still, there is also it's also possible to send data also to the cloud for further processing and so on, which is uh, pretty easy to do here. So. I think I already said that a single high view cluster scales up to millions of devices, which is very critical here for the V2X use cases, because if you think about it, we don't want to connect two traffic lights with three cars. We're talking about even cities, hundreds of thousands of participants communicating at the same time. And here with HiveMQ as a broker, you can scale to millions of these devices. So our customers run business critical business critical applications. So we're talking about the, the um, let's say, fastest growing and largest connected car platforms on earth, um, which are our customers, which are built upon having new technologies. We're talking about industry 4.0 use cases, which is just critical because um, basically our customers are losing money if anything doesn't work as expected. So this is why having is just built reliably. And also this is more for the operations people Observability is key. So this would also be a talk on its own. But this is something, operability and observability is really on top of our minds. And we have all the tools provided. Even if we have simple single devices that are having problem, like problems like traffic lights and so on, 
operators can detect what problems are there and how they can be fixed. And there's also the tools available to fix it. And having it also integrates with a lot of services directly. There are these technologies you will see all over the place, like things like Apache Kafka um, and other technologies. What is really used today uh, in data centers to connect things together. And um, HiveMQ allows you to do that out of the box. And you can run it everywhere. We run it now here on, the M on MECs. Um, you, it runs on bare metal and also, of course, in the cloud. So I, I like to quickly talk about um, MQDT again. So because there's one thing that is also, I think, critical for people to understand. And MQDT is not a new technology because people sometimes say, yeah, this is this new technology that's now around. Um, is, isn't there, let's say, what is the risk in deploying that? I think it's important to understand MQDT was built in 1999. So MQDT is a technology that was built basically for monitoring oil pipelines um, and also acting upon things in oil, oil pipelines. So a bidirectional communication with oil pipelines in 1999 in the US. So Philips 66 wanted to use basically the new TCP IP based, um, let's say VSAT uh, communication. And this is where MQDT was born. So it was born for satellite communication. And for people who have been long around to, to use satellite communication or use satellite communication today, um, it has a few properties, like it's pretty expensive and um, bandwidth is really low, latencies are really high. And so MQT was really built for that. Turns out that in 2010, a lot of the problems people had back then um, came back as the, the IoT and um, and now this is why MQT is so widely used. So this is technology that is used in a lot of industries. It's rock solid. And together with Vodafone, we're now bringing this to V2X, um, which allows us, yeah, basically, hopefully to save lives um, and making the road safer for everybody. And so we're super thrilled here. Um, I hope you you enjoyed this quick thing and and we got get a lot of great questions in here so um let us use the time for for additional questions please also use um the q a window if you have additional questions here so we are happy to to answer them um before we go into the q a section let's talk quickly about the next steps here um so so guido do you wanna wanna take over and talk about the the rollout yeah, thanks, thanks, Dominic. Um, I think it was also great hearing about the, the the technology MQTT in particular, how this evolved. I think in the meanwhile, also the cellular networks evolved from from 2G, 3G, 4G to 5G. So nowadays we have 4G and 5G, which are very uh, reliable networks, um, especially 5G. And I think the combination of MQTT designed already for 2G and, and now we are moving to 5G. I think that's a, that's a great combination. Um, so the next step from our perspective, I think the edge environment is something that you already can use. Yeah. So we have in Vodafone Business certain a product portfolio that you can look at um, from unified comms over IoT solutions where MQTT is widely used, by the way, um, um, over to edge compute edge cloud uh, services that we are offering. The V2X platform is right now under, still under development that uh, will be then launched uh, soon. So please stay tuned. So there will be an announcement and also uh, a dedicated uh, a website where you can sign up and where you can test this and experience the added value. Um, so if you have any questions, you can, you can also send me uh, an email and I will get back to you. And then over to Dominic again. Uh, yes. So, so before we go, we go to the Q and A. So for people who haven't heard about MQDT before and uh, who want to get deeper into that, so this was really. So we didn't talk a lot about the technology here. Um, so I know there are people who would like to go deeper and understand how basically MQDT can be used and how it actually works. So. 
uh, the best resources to learn. So besides, there's a on YouTube you can Google you can basically look up for the MQDT essentials. This is also a, a ten piece video series I recorded, which is uh, in a three to five minute bytes where I walk through um, all the technical details and how it actually works. If you're interested in that, for people who like to prefer reading, so there is an ebook available which we call the MQDT essentials. That is our most popular content ever. That was we initially released it a few years ago. Um, it's one of the most popular resources to to basically get all the concepts of MQDT, so everybody in an hour can be, uh, let's say, from absolute beginner to a very intermediate user user of MQDT by learning all the concepts. If you want to look at HiveMQ in particular, if this is of interest to you. Um, you can go to hivenview.com and also download a free trial version if you want to try it out and get your feet wet. If you just want to understand how technologies like MQDT and HiveMQ, how we help transform the automotive industry and how we help customers, besides we have case studies online with different, um, let's say, um, OEMs. So some are online, some of them we aren't allowed to talk about yet. But um, what we what is here is we have a Connect a car platform white paper available also. So if you're more on, let's say, the car platform side and you want to understand how MQT enables that, you can also um, basically look at that, uh, download it, and um, basically understand what the benefits are. Also compared to traditional technologies used for building connected car platforms. Okay, so I think now um, we, we can open the floor to questions. So thank you very much for attending. So I think we can dive yes, directly into the Yeah, Q &A. definitely. We will dive into that, Dominic, for sure. So thank you so much for that um, insightful presentation, both. I think attendees will definitely agree with me that it was a great discussion and some fantastic insights shared throughout. I just want to thank the attendees as well who have been sending in their questions. Um, do keep them coming, and we'll try and answer as many as possible in the time that we have left. Um, but to kind of kick us off on um, the questions that we have um, from attendees, um, Dominic, I will come to you straight away on this question, but Gouda, if you have anything you would like to add, please do. Um, Dominic, how is um, MQTT different from DSRC technology and does MQTT enable V2V communication? Ah, yeah, so it's, it's a good one. Um, so. So especially because we're talking about V2X. So for people who are not familiar, I'm, I'm pretty much assuming uh, that uh, the question is here um, about dedicated short range communications. Um, so this is my, my assumptions here for what DSRC is, is meant here. Um, so, so yeah, <laughs> this, is a, this is a good one. Basically what MQDT needs. So let's start from a technology. If you want to run MQDT, you really need a TCP IP stack. So this is critical. Um, so I personally, I am not an expert on DSRC. I, I want to be completely transparent here. So this is not um, my, my main expertise. Um, but what we're talking about here is really V2X communication. So um, for vehicle to vehicle communication, um, I know there are a lot of standards and a lot of specification is taking place. Um, so as far as I know, MQDT is today is not widely deployed here. So this is as far as my understanding is. So at least we, our company, is not involved in any of these efforts here. Um, so, um, but Guido, if you want also to add something to that question. Um, feel free yeah, I can add something. Um, so we have experienced DSLC and cellular V2X uh, direct mode uh, um, um, using it's called the PC5 uh, interface or there's DSLC on Wi-Fi um, um, called ITS G5 or WAVE in the US. Um, so this is a direct mode where you basically broadcast information to everyone in the proximity using a dedicated spectrum at 5.9 gigahertz. So this is this is the car to car, the traditional car to car world. Um, I think they, you can run IP protocols on top, but from my perspective, it doesn't make sense to use MQTT here um, because you broadcast information. If someone is receiving it, it's fine. If not, then he doesn't have this information. Um, so it's really made for this ad hoc broadcasting of information. What we actually do, and this is where MQTT comes in, is to replicate the, the communication pattern using a cloud environment. 
So you are no longer restricted by the physical wave propagations because on dedicated short range, if there's a truck in between, you, you can't reach through that. So you will not talk even 10 or 50 meters to the next car if there's a truck in between. But if you're connected to a cellular network, uh, it still works. So that's, that's the main difference. And in MQTT, you subscribe to a specific area where information is distributed. Um, so that's, that's the difference. And we are a bit more flexible with MQTT because the region could be uh, all over Germany, or it could be just London as a city, or just a tiny, tiny district or road segment. Perfect. Thank you, Guido. A great detailed answer there. Um, so for our next question then, can MQT, uh, MQTT support um, to receive the complete history of data, which it may have missed if devices were offline for some time? Um, Dominic, I will come to you on this question first. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so absolutely. So MQTT is actually built for this kind of situations because as I, as I outlined, MQTT is built for reliable communications over unreliable channels. So what this means is uh, that if you, so there are two ways basically to interact with an MQTT infrastructure. You could, the device could, te could tell, okay, basically I'm a ephemeral device. I'm not interested in the history. So please do not create a, a so-called session for me. So when I'm offline, I'm offline. Um, but what you could also do is uh, you could basically as a device, and this is a simple basically property when you connect to the infrastructure, is you're saying, hey, I want to have a session. So please broker, in case I'm offline, please remember all the messages I missed. And so you can receive it. And this is exactly what's happening. So um, let's say you're driving with the car let's say through a tunnel or somewhere where you don't have connectivity at all, you're losing connectivity. And so you're missing a few very important data packets. As soon as you go online, the MQTT broker will make sure that you receive the message. So basically you're receiving all of the messages that you missed. There's one thing in addition that is of interest um, because not all data is valuable enough for retransmission if you're offline because also there's some data which has a so-called expiry in there. Um, because if you're offline for two minutes and you have a very time sensitive data packet that that doesn't have any value two minutes afterwards, um, basically you can use the expiry mechanism, which is also part of MQDT. So you only get the messages that still have value. But these are, let's say, a bit more technical details for people who want to learn more about that. Um, I recommend to go to the links um, I outlined because here, these are the conversations we, we have a lot here uh, also in the video series. Um, where it's explained how all that works and how you, you could build this kind of use cases. But this was a long, the lo long answer for yes, MQT allows for a complete history of data that was missed by a device. Perfect. Thank you, Dominic. Um, Guido, I'm going to come to you straight on this question and then Dominic, feel free to add um, your insights at the end. But is communication of MQTT IT based unlike um, SMS? Exactly. This is IP based. I think it it uh, it relies on IP and TCP, uh, basically using the open standards in the internet. Uh, so MQTT for me, and this is how I explain it. I'm not the expert, but MQTT is like HTTP that you use with your web browser in the web. Yeah. But Dominic, I think that's maybe you can add more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. So yes, you, you really need IP and also you need TCP. So, and this is something um, that, that is important to bear in mind. Um, you need TCP IP for MQDT. Um, you could technically also run it over other protocols like SCTP, if you're, um, which is technically also possible, but not widely used as far as I know, um, because you really have some, some assumptions about the underlying implementations here. Uh, basically, you need this kind of, of data streams. You need lossless communication, uh, which MQT builds upon. So I just want to add here, because I also see some questions also leading towards that. There is also, uh, let's say, an upcoming smaller, let's say, sister of MQTT called MQT for sensor networks. It also runs over UDP. But today, um, yeah, also, let's say, for these low latency use cases, uh, TCP works very well, because actually, if you want to run things over UDP, in the end, sometimes you just replicate things TCP already has in there, um, like flow control and other things. Um, but yes, great, great question. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so for our next question, what are typical use cases and QTT supports for autonomous driving? Dominic, I'll come to you again on this one. Uh, yeah, so there are actually a lot of use cases. So I'm, I'm wondering, Guido, do you want to jump in here or do you want me to answer that? Yeah, just what came, came into my mind. I think V2X is a great use case already for autonomous uh, driving, uh, but I think there are cases, uh, for example, autonomous valley parking, where you need to interact uh, maybe with the parking infrastructure. Um, um, but I think V2X is one of the use cases, and the not the day to day, the day one use cases in V2X, but also sharing trajectories, for example, in the proximity and other information that are valuable for autonomous driving. So that would be my my sense to the question. Thank you. Dominic, um, I will um, go following on to another question because we have quite a lot coming in then. Um, mm -hmm. For our next question, um, Guido, maybe you can bring us back to this one as well. Is it possible to somehow prioritize messages sent in over MQT? Um, can um, Or can this just be somehow achieved if it's not possible? Yeah, let, let me start basically on the radio interface, right? I think for V2X communication, the 3GPP has standardized prioritization in terms of uh, QCI levels. So there are quality, in, uh, quality of service parameters that you can basically put in the network in order to prioritize the communication. So already below IP level, uh, data is being prioritized. Um, and then there are other IP mechanisms, and I think Dominic, you can you can talk about mechanisms then on on MQTT level as well. Uh, yes, yes. So um, I think what is also important to understand for when you go to the application layer, um, MQTT gives a few guarantees about the data. This means data is in sequence. This is uh, very important, um, but it says only on a per topic level. Because so MQTT works basically by segmented, segmenting the data space into a so-called topics, which you can imagine this like a um, let's say hierarchy of strings, similar to, to what you see with a file system. Like you have this, which can go down, and this kind of topics basically segment the data, um, and you can have this. Uh, the MQTT specification allows also for these kind of different topics, of course. And the in-order messaging is always guaranteed for um, on a pair topic level. So yes, absolutely, this is possible to have high priority topics. This is not part of the MQT specification, though. So um, if you have a device where you really want to make sure that a specific data point always gets, let's say, gets high priority, and then you need to work around the MQT standard by uh, using, let's say, broker capabilities. So with HiveNQ, we have an extension system where these kind of things can be achieved. Um, but this is not part of the standard. And as Guido mentioned, this is something you very likely would also make sure not, not only take care of the application level, uh, but the further you go down with the layer where you can solve that, the better. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'll let you have a breath on this one, um, Dominic. But can a broker initiate a connection to the client? Um, Guido, this one for you. If not, how can they do this? And is that through other means? Yeah. Yes, very good question. And this is also something um, that is very important to understand for connected car use cases. So there are so many examples out there where you open an attack vector on a car by putting a server inside the car that is open to the internet or some, let's say, private network. This is a huge anti-pattern we have seen. So how MQTT works is the connection is always initiated by the client and it always um, uh, basically connects to the broker. And this is critical, why? Because on the broker, you can then do your authentication, your authorization. So is the device allowed to connect? But also, what can the device do? Can it just subscribe to data, just subscribe to specific data? Can it even send data, and so on? So permission, permissions are critical for any production deployment. And the thing is, you can, with an MQT broker, you can basically centralize uh, that kind of things. Um, so yes, and this is an absolute security feature because also let's because there are other technologies where servers are let's say on the device itself. Why a, a thing that we have seen a lot is um, with our technologies that you can basically denial of service 
a device if you know the public endpoint. Because if you have a device that limited, has limited compute capabilities and limited memory, um, if you hammer on it, you can basically, even if you're not cracking it or you're getting inside the device, you can basically um, render it uh, useless. And this is something you really need to avoid. So with MQT, you have a client. The client has not a, is not exposed to the internet. The client always does the connection in a secure way to the broker. And the broker is hardened. Why? Because it can run on hardened infrastructure. And you can, it can protect itself against denial of service attacks and so on, um, which is much better from a security perspective. So, so no, the broker cannot initiate a connection to the client. And this is one of the best features of MQT from my point of view. Perfect. Thank you, Dominic. Guido, I know that was a long um, and detailed answer there, but did you have anything you wanted to add to this question? No, no, I think that was that was perfect. I think that was an MQTT-related question anyway. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so how can you guarantee that you are not overwhelming a topic reader based on its geolocation? Uh, so Guido, can do you, you want to answer this one first? Yeah, can you repeat that again? How can you... Guarantee that you are not overwhelming a topic reader based on its geolocation. Uh, Maybe we'll hand this one to Dominic first. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm also not 100% sure about the message, but let me let me try um, if I understood that correctly. So, so I think it's about if you have some if you have some device, for example, that is subscribed to a lot of data. How can you not make sure to not overwhelm that? Um, so MQT, so on the one side, you have, of course, all the layers below, which can help you also. But on the MQT application layer, there is things like flow control, which basically allows um, the device, the consuming device, to make sure that it only gets as much messages as it can consume. Um, and also, this is one thing on the application itself, but what is usually done, and this is also something we, we worked with Waterphone on, is how can you distribute the, let's say, the topic space or basically the data space um, in a so fine grained uh, fashion that devices that, let's say, are in, um, let's say, Berlin in this exact street are only getting the messages it's interested in. Because, for example, if you have a device in Berlin, you want to make sure it doesn't get any data from Munich because it can't handle that. And it, it basically just needs to throw it away because um, if you're not interested in data, this, this is bad. And again, two things, separate basically the data space. Um, this is a bit like, like if this is something we can follow up uh, on that, but this takes a bit more than two minutes to explain um, how that would work. But this is actually possible with MQD topics. And then you still have the flow control. So you make sure to not overwhelm a device. So it, it can basically decide itself how much capacity it has. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so for our next question then, um, as we have so many coming in, um, how can you guarantee that a cellular um, service is di district, districtly dependent on country, region, and even MNO independently available, like the ad hoc networks or V2X? Very long question there, so I'll push it to the slide um, for everyone else to see as well. Do you, know, yeah, do you I think have that, a... That... Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I think that that's more a political one as well. I think uh, uh, technology-wise, there, there are different solutions. Uh, so we are working with other operators to make this interoperable. Uh, that's one thing. So it doesn't only work uh, if you are connected to a single operator. Um, um, so what, what I think would be a good solution if you have a, a distinct road operators using that digital platform, because you always know that a car or road user is on a particular road operated by a certain road operator, like a highway operator in a, in a, in a country. So if you going onto that highway, you basically the end point for the digital infrastructure. So the, in our case, the MQTT broker endpoint would be oper operated by this highway operator, not necessarily by the MNO. I think what we are building here is not necessarily uh, operated by the MNO. I think we do this initially to basically seed the market and get it started. Uh, but politically, it could make sense to enable road operators to do that. Or I think you build a consortium, uh, maybe uh, from independent companies uh, 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 running this. 
So there are different uh, different options, uh, but I think the technology as such has has no limitation. Yeah. I think because we are open standards, um, we can we can uh, enable basically that this is not a closed siloed environment. So we are not using proprietary protocols. Uh, everything should be open, and uh, also multiple entities can can run this environment if they want. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Dominic. Did you want to add anything to that at all? No, I think this was, was great. Nothing to add. Perfect. So for um, this question then, shall um, MQTT guarantee the restrictive reliability constraints for V2V over 5G? Hulo, do you want to take this one as well? Yeah. Uh, so uh, guarantee is always uh, difficult. I think we have several capabilities to basically um, to make the performance better. Right, uh, so we have 4G, 5G. We need to enhance coverage. That's one for sure. We need to do that on on highways and along all the roads. We need to reduce latencies on the communication link. We want to reduce latencies on the uh, uh, the, the transmission. That's why we are using the edge environment, um, and we have some QoS capabilities, like an emergency call is prioritized. A V2X communication over UU, over the, the, the UU interface, can also be prioritized. So there are means to basically guarantee, so to say, um, uh, the, the quality of service. Yeah. But it's not a hard, I think we, can, we can't commit to 10, 10 milliseconds, basically. Um, but we do all of our best to make it as, as fast as possible. It's the same with dedicated short range there's also no guarantee yeah in, in this example if i mentioned if there's a, a, a truck with a metallic uh, container um you might not receive the message at, at all perfect thank you um so right. dominic how will be um how will cyber security be affected on this one oh it's a, it's a generic one so so in the end um as, as i mentioned so everything here is built around um, security in mind. So, um, so I mean, there are many, many aspects we could go into that, but um, I think what is very critical to understand is we're having encrypted communication channels on the application level, which is TLS. There is a proper authentication methods um, and authorization methods, so permissions. And also things like, this is also critical, not on the direct security level, but also things like um, auditing is very important. So auditing is just also key. So make sure if any changes are made that this is also being logged and, and, and basically properly auditable. And then it's also things like, um, which also is important for security reasons, is um, things like making sure that uh, things are not overwhelmed, like uh, what we call overload protection and so on. But this is a really broad topic. So, um, so this is something, if there are any specific questions, happy to answer other than that. I mean, I have a whole, let's say, conference talk with a one hour just focusing on, on cybersecurity, how this is done properly. Okay, perfect. Yes. So for the attendee who did send in that question, please do reach out to um, the Hive um, MQ team um, and they will definitely get back to you with more detail. Um, so for our next question, um, then it's kind of um, following that same line of thinking. How do you deal with the initial TLS certification um, when clients lose connection and when it reconnects, it has to authenticate again? Yeah, so um, very good question. And this is, by the way, one of the key advantages why with always on, because with technologies like HTTP or other request response technologies, you would basically have a handshake all the time. Um, and, the, and the handshake is it's really like large, we're talking about kilobytes of data just for establishing the secure encrypted communication channel. So <clears throat> um, with the always on capability, you greatly basically reduce that because only if the device really loses their connection, um, it would, would reconnect and have a handshake again. So a lot of people think, yeah, let's just remove that handshake because it's, it's expensive and so on. Don't do that. I think TLS is always key to use. And there are a few tricks you can do, though, to reduce the handshake size. On the one side is, of course, basically look at your certificate chain. I mean, in the end, uh, you can do a lot here what your certificate chain looks like. Um, 
but also what is super critical is not only the certificate chain, but also look at the TLS version. If you're using state of the art um, uh, transport layer security with version 1.3, you also get things like uh, zero round trip capabilities. Um, I would only recommend it if you know what they're doing, but even with older TLS versions, you have things like session tokens, which basically allow you to reduce the handshake significantly. So there are ways to do that. Uh, but this needs proper development um, also on the client side to, to pull that off. But uh, we have seen large reductions of data transmission for our customers um, by basically using the capabilities TLS brings out of the box. And super, super important, here, TLS is a technology used by basically all, even on this platform right now, it's used for the whole web, billions of users every day are using TLS for all services. The largest companies in the world use that. Military um, folks use that. So TLS is really secure. So, um, but it comes with a price, but you can reduce it by proper configuration. Thank you, Dominic. Um, so Guido, I'll come over to you on this question then. How is location determined for the messages? Um, are Tenny saying, surely I would only want to um, messages to be in my closed area? Yeah, exactly. And there's another question on how do you target geo regions with MQTT? I think that uh, goes into a similar direction. I think what we are doing, and we are complying with the V2X standards, so we are using the Etsy standards, and the messages are encoded with the geo location, but we are not using this one because we want to, to keep the, the privacy of the users. So what we do is, and this is why we have also selected MQTT, so the client subscribe to a service and a region. So we, we, we're using basically tiles de defined by a geo hash. And when you subscribe, you will basically receive information for this geographical tile, you know, for this area only. And when you publish information, also only the users subscribe to this area will receive it. So that's basically how we are uh, 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 distributing information um, uh, in a geographical manner Perfect. and this, this is this is the key i think and and this is why mqtt is uh, super useful yeah because you can define the topic structure and, and and we have defined it in a way that we allow this this geographical communication without um, um, basically exposing the the private data the, the the exact location we do not know where these are if we are not looking inside of the V2X message. If you look inside of the V2X message, you have it, but that's not needed. I think we can even encrypt it. Okay, thank you. Um, so on to this question then is, how um, how do you deal with waking up the device? Sure I yeah, myself. I think we, yeah, we, we assume that the, the device is always up and running. I think we have methods, and uh, when we work with car OEMs, for example, they have methods to wake up devices as well. Uh, when they are, for example, parked and uh, they, 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 they are running a, a software update, um, there are methods, some use SMS, for example, to wake up a device. But when they're on the road, I think they are attached, we call it, attached to the network and ready. Yeah, and then the MQTT client would subscribe and being connected all the time. That's the same with a smartphone. So if you are on a bike with a smartphone app, using our SDK and connected to the MQTT broker, uh, there's no need to wake the device up. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Um, Dominic, anything to add? Um, yeah, so I think Gil, Gil said it perfectly. So, um, so we know from uh, let's say also different car OEMs, I mean, like SMS is one way to do that, um, which is a very traditional way. Um, but different car OEMs do this differently. I mean, there are a lot of car OEMs which where the MQTT connection also can run for a very, very long time. We're talking about days and more, even if, if the car is not operated for this kind of real-time push experience still. So there are, there are ways how this is being done. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in the end, it's also a trade-off about battery life versus uh, staying connected. And this is something that really depends also on the services being used. And as Guido said, here for, for V2X use cases, um, the devices are in motion usually anyways, and, and then it's clear you have this always-on connectivity as we outlined. 
Perfect, thank you. Um, so we have a couple of uh, time for a couple more questions. So um, for our, we'll make this the second last question of our session today. Um, does client vehicles, this is another long one, so I'll push it to the slide area, but um, does client slash vehicles are uh, pro, um, proximity limited? Um, or is it possible to be client of a remote queue to a monitor or analyze in advance a route to an, um, enhance planning or reduce risks of a trip? Yeah, exactly. That, that's basically uh, related to the question I'd answered before. I think we leave the flexibility to the client, right? Uh, if a client, for whatever reason, wants to subscribe to a region ahead, I think it's it's possible. You know, if you're driving fast on a highway and you want to, for example, subscribe to the next segment in a few kilometers ahead of you to, to just take this information, you can do that. That's the advantage. I think you are not limited to the physics of dedicated short range. You can subscribe to um, the services and regions ahead of you and ahead of time. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so for our last question here, um, it's more of a comment rather than an actual question. Um, I don't know if you guys want to say anything on it, um, but in the attendees are asking, but in V2X making, um, surely broker can reach to the client is essential for safety point of view. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm ju just realizing, I think the, the, the question was broken up, um, like in oh, yes, three questions. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, so, yeah. No, no, please go. So, okay. You can see the questions there. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so, so I think um, it was a pr pretty long comment. So let me, let me try to summarize. So, so there was a comment that, um, when a device loses the connection um, and it doesn't know it lost the connection, um, then basically there is a, a sa there's a safety concern raised by this person that uh, because um, it needs to make be sure that the broker can reach the client. This is essential from a safety point of view. And yes, this is a pretty good one. And I think from a technical point of view, what we're talking about here is basically what what is also considered the, the half open TCP connection problem. What this means is. I mean, there, there can be situations um, which are fortunate, fortunately pretty rare, but there are the situations where basically you have, and with any basically connectivity te technology, um, where the server and the client um, are not in sync. Uh, ba basically, this means the client, for example, thinks it's still connected, but the broker doesn't think it's connected anymore. But with MQTT, what you usually have is um, the broker thinks the client is still connected, but it's not. And how, and in this case, the broker doesn't need to reach out to the client, but what is critical here that the client knows that it's not connected anymore. So it detects basically the broken TCP connection, technically speaking. And, and this is, MQT is built for that because um, just imagine that if you have a VSET communication, this happened all the time because basically they faked TCP back then. Um, so they built in what so, a so-called keep alive mechanism. This basically is, um, the broker, uh, basically the client, is basically ping-ponging, pinging the broker all the time, are you alive, are you alive, are you alive? The same is also true for the broker. So the client tells the broker, okay, if you are not connected anymore, uh, basically I, I believe you're connected, but I don't see data, the client promises in the initial connection handshake that it will send every, let's say, 10 seconds or so data. And if not, the broker will basically disconnect the TCP connection. So I know this was pretty technical right now, but also the comment was pretty technical here. So basically what I'm saying is the client basically probes all the time if the connection is still alive. Um, and if not, it would instantly reconnect. But the thing is, if it cannot reconnect to the broker because it doesn't have connectivity, also the broker, even if this would be possible, could not reach the client, of course. But it's all in the hand of the client, so yes, the proper client implementation is critical here. And this is also why it's critical to use uh, the kind of SDKs uh, that the Vodafone provides um, for using that, because this is usually something as an application developer, one really shouldn't care. Perfect, thank you. So a very detailed and technical answer, as you said, but I'm actually gonna leave it there for everyone and wrap up with that final question to end today's webinar. So thank you to our panelists, Dominic and Guido for joining us. Um, if you didn't manage to share your questions with our experts directly here today, please do reach out to the team at um, Automotive IQ or any of the speakers directly. This session will be available on demand very soon. So please do share it with any of your colleagues who are unable to join us today. This does conclude today's webinar and we look forward to 
to see you again very soon. Thanks again, Kudo and Dominic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye.